Students sometimes begin the economic course with a, with a misperception, and that is that economics is about money. Absolutely not. Economics is a much broader set of tools that can apply to all kinds of decisions that you make in daily life. The definition of economics is this. Economics is the study of rational choice under conditions of scarcity. That definition has two terms in it that are key. The first is scarcity. Scarcity means an imbalance between the amount of something that people want and the amount that's freely available. One of the best ways to come to grips with the concept of scarcity is to try to imagine something that isn't scarce. What would that be? Sometimes students suggest air isn't scarce, it's all around us. Yes, but the kind of air that people want, clean, breathable air, is certainly scarce, and especially scarce in cities with a lot of pollution. At one point in Tokyo, there were vending machines on the street where people would insert a coin to buy a breath of breathable, clean air. In that case, air was scarce. There was an imbalance. People wanted more of it than there was freely available. Well, what about space? There seems to be plenty of space. Yes, but there's not a lot of space in cities. There's less space in your dorm room than you'd want. All this stuff has to be parceled out because there isn't as much as people would like to have if it were freely available. What about garbage? There seems to be plenty of garbage, no scarcity of garbage. Aha, but see, that's where the definition comes into play. It's not that there is an infinite amount of garbage. There is a strictly limited amount of garbage. The reason garbage is not scarce is that nobody wants it. Scarcity is an imbalance between the amount of something that people want and the amount of that good that is freely available. Anytime something is scarce, we've got to figure out how to use it, how to share it, how to parcel it out among its competing uses. And that requires some kind of decision, some kind of choice. And that leads us to the second term, rational choice. Rational choice, or the word rationality in economics, refers to people making calculated, self-interested decisions. It requires that you be willing to consider costs and benefits, all of the factors that are involved in a decision, and choose that course of action that is most satisfying to you, the one that maximizes your wealth, the one that maximizes your company's profits, the one that maximizes your satisfaction from the way you use your limited income or your limited amount of time. We say that an agent is rational if that agent considers cause and effect, if that agent considers the consequences of his or her choices and chooses those courses of action that provide the most satisfaction. Rational choice is calculated self-interest. So if we have calculated, self-interested people operating in a situation of scarcity, then we've got economics. One example of this is the concept of opportunity cost. We imagine that when people make a choice, they consider the opportunity cost of that choice. The opportunity cost of a choice is the best alternative you give up when you make that choice. For instance, if you go to your economics class one morning, the best alternative might have been an extra hours of sleep, hours worth of sleep. Rather than staying in bed and sleeping, you chose to come to your economics class instead. The sleep was the opportunity cost of your choice. If you are enrolled in college this year, you're getting a good education, which might be satisfying in its own right. It may also be that that education is your key to a higher salary that leads to more goods and services in the future. But the opportunity cost of those goods and services in the future and the satisfaction of your expanded mind is the money that you're not making now and all of the toys that you could be buying with the income that you're giving up. Because you're in school, you aren't holding down a job with all the time that you are using studying and attending classes. The time away from work is lost income, lost goods and services, and lost satisfaction. So the opportunity cost of your investment in your future is the present satisfaction you could get from a higher paycheck. There's an opportunity cost. There's no such thing as a free lunch. Anything that you enjoy, you enjoy at the cost of giving up something else. If you enjoy driving a pickup, the opportunity cost is you're not driving a Volkswagen that day. If you enjoy a vacation to the Bahamas, your opportunity cost might be um, a trip to California. 
every choice you make involves an opportunity that you don't choose. Well, what does this have to do with money? Not very much. See, the point is, economics is not about money. Economics is about analyzing the way people make choices in conditions of scarcity. We can make predictions about how you choose to use your time between studying, working, playing, spending time with friends. We can come up with an economic model that predicts the way you'll respond if we know enough about your preferences, your abilities, and the constraints that are put on you from the outside. We can also come up with economic models of who people choose to marry, economic models of when countries go to war. There are even economic models of which religions people choose to affiliate with. One economist has even suggested that you can come up with an economic model of who chooses to commit suicide as an economic calculation. If the costs and the benefits are aligned properly, people just choose to check out. Now, some people are offended by this. They think, well, why should we have an economic model of these very personal things? And maybe you're right. But the point is, economics is a very flexible set of tools, and it seeks to apply itself anywhere rational agents are operating in a situation of scarcity, anywhere that there are goods and services that are strictly limited, that have to be shared in some way. In the next lecture, we'll look at another definition of economics, one that has to do with value, and this might seem a little more applicable to business. In the last lesson, we defined economics as the study of rational choice under conditions of scarcity. Now we will introduce a second definition of economics that may seem to have a little more to do with business. Economics is the study of the creation and distribution of value. To understand the importance of this definition, you need to know what an economist means by the term value. And value sometimes becomes a, a bit of a squishy concept. We know what it is, but it's hard to measure in some cases, and therefore seems difficult to define. Value is simply the difference between the benefit of an activity and the cost of that activity. It's a kind of measure of profit or extra satisfaction. For instance, suppose I sell bread in my bakery. If I can sell my bread for $5 and the cost of producing the bread is $3, then I'm creating $2 worth of profit. In some sense, that $2 worth of profit is the value of the bread, but it's a little more subtle than that. Suppose you have an apple, and I come along and offer to trade you your apple for my peach. Would you do the trade? Sure you would if you like the peach more than the apple. The trade has a benefit and a cost for you. The benefit is you get a peach. The cost is you give up an apple. The apple is the opportunity cost of the peach. The benefit from the peach is weighed against the cost of parting with your apple. Value is created if you like the peach more, because then the benefit is greater than the cost. But exactly how much value is created by this trade? In order to know how much value is created, we need some kind of yardstick, some way of measuring benefits and costs. And one way that we can do that is to use money as the yardstick, to assign dollar values to benefits and to costs. Suppose you think the peach is worth a dollar, that is, you would be willing to spend a dollar on this peach. And suppose the apple is worth 40 cents to you, that is, a measure of the satisfaction you would get from eating the apple. If I trade you your apple for my peach, you're getting a benefit that you value at $1. And the opportunity cost is the 40 cents worth of satisfaction that you would have received from the apple. $1 worth of benefit minus 40 cents worth of cost means that we have created 60 cents worth of value for you when you trade the apple for the peach. 
See, putting a dollar value on things allows us to measure economic value in a concrete way. But this sometimes will require us to put dollar values on things that, that, that we might resist. For instance, what is the benefit that you get from working at your job? Well, I get a salary and I can use that to buy toys. Well, a good approximation of the benefit you get from your job is the dollar value that you're paid for your work there. The paycheck that you receive might be a good approximation of the benefit you get from working at the job. Now, what about the cost of working at the job? Well, the cost is you're not spending time with your family and friends. How would you put a dollar value on that opportunity cost? Well, you can imagine that we sit you down at a table and say, look, you can spend time with your family or friends, or you can go to work. And you say, well, I think I'd rather go to work if the salary's right. And I say, well, what salary would make you not care whether you work or stay home with your friends? And you cite a number. And the number lets me know the amount of money that you would be willing to accept in exchange for coming to work rather than being with your friends. If I'm careful about the way I structure this experiment, I can find a dollar value that I consider your price or your cost for giving up your time with your friends. I can put a dollar value on it by seeing how you behave. I ask you to go out with me for a pizza, and you say, no, sorry, I have to work this afternoon. I found out that you're only making $5 working this afternoon, so I know that you'd rather have $5 than spend the afternoon with me with a pizza. Well, that tells me something about how you value this opportunity. The point is, once we can assign dollar values to things, it becomes very easy to calculate economic value. The value of the benefit, or the economic number, the dollar value of the benefit, minus the dollar measure of the cost, gives us some kind of profit left over, and that's called economic value. Let's consider another case. Suppose I'm baking bread, and I can sell it for $5 a loaf. Well, what is the opportunity cost of my baking a loaf of bread? I've got milk, eggs, and flour, all of these resources that I'm using, and they all have other uses. They have opportunity costs. If the price of eggs is a good measure of the opportunity cost of eggs, that is, someone is willing to pay 50 cents for my egg that I'm about to use in a loaf of bread, that tells me that the egg is worth 50 cents to him. Rather than put the egg in my loaf of bread, I can give it to him to make an omelet, and the 50 cents that he's willing to pay is a good measure of the opportunity cost of the egg. After all, I could have the 50 cents if he has the omelet, so I'm giving up 50 cents in order to make this loaf of bread using this egg. What about my own labor? My own labor has an opportunity cost. I could be at home watching television or outside playing with my children. In that case, I would be enjoying another activity rather than using my labor to make bread. Well, what dollar value would I put on those foregone opportunities? That is a measure of the opportunity cost of my labor. If I'm making bread, then there are several factors of production that go into this business. There is labor, there is the land that my store sits on, there are all of the resources like milk, flour, and eggs that I'm using to produce the bread, there is also the capital, the money that I borrowed to make my operation run, the money that I borrowed to build a store and to buy the resources before I've been able to sell the bread. There's also what we call entrepreneurship. If I'm the owner of this business, I'm taking a risk and bringing my talent in to help the business run well. There's an opportunity cost to that also. I could have peace of mind rather than being worried about whether my business is going to succeed. I could use my talent making art or writing stories instead of running a business. So entrepreneurship also has an opportunity cost. If you add up the opportunity costs of all the resources that are used in the production of bread, you have the opportunity cost of the production of bread. If you subtract the opportunity cost from the benefits of the loaf of bread that you're creating, you have the economic value of that bread, the economic value, the difference between the benefit and the cost of producing it. Well, who gets that economic value? That's a good question. Who gets the bonus? Who gets the gravy? The gravy can be spread over all of the resources. I might decide that I'm going to pay myself, as an entrepreneur, a very, very large bonus over and above the opportunity cost of my time and talent. That means the entrepreneur is getting that economic profit in the form of a bonus or extra profit. 
It could be that the person who owns the land that I'm uh, sitting on has uh, some power over me and charges me an extra high rent. In that way, the landowner is getting a share of the economic profit by demanding a higher payment for the land than he could demand for someone else. If I am uh, using capital and people are putting their money at risk in my business, I may decide to give these capital owners some extra bonus from having taken the risk. If I pay them more than their opportunity cost, I'm sharing the economic profit with them. Economic profit is the difference between the benefit of an activity and its opportunity cost. And that economic profit will be created any time you create something of value. But who gets the economic profit depends on the way the business is organized. It depends on how competitive the markets are for labor and capital. It depends on how specialized particular skills are that the entrepreneur brings into the business. The important thing to know at this point is the concept of economic value, the difference between, business, between benefits and cost. Anytime economic value is created, economists are usually pleased. This is the thing that we're trying to make more of, whether we're making it through trades, like the apple for the peach, or whether we're making it through the production of goods, like the bread, where the benefit is greater than the opportunity cost of production. Economics is about figuring out when and where value is created and who gets the value in the form of benefits beyond their opportunity costs. We've said that economics is the study of rational choice in the face of scarcity. Let's talk now about what it means for economics to be a study. Economics is called a social science or a behavioral science. And as a science, economics is a disciplined way of thinking through problems. The scientific method is a tried and true way for knowledge to accumulate, to ask questions, to craft explanations, and to come up with ways of testing those explanations against what's going on in the real world. So economics as a science uses the scientific method to understand the way the world works. The scientific method begins with a question. That is, all science begins with curiosity about the way the world works. If you want to be a scientist, you should develop the habit of curiosity. That is, asking the question why at least three times a day. You drive through a little town and you wonder, why are all the gas stations clustered on the four corners of the main intersection? Or you go to the grocery store and you wonder, why are there 150 different kinds of breakfast cereal? And yet, there are only really three categories, cereal that tastes like fruit, cereal that tastes like chocolate, and cereal that's good for you. Why? 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 Ask the question, why? And you're training your mind to be scientific and preparing yourself to be sharper and more flexible. Economics really asks three questions over and over again. The first question is, what should we produce? That is, what are we going to produce of all the possible baskets and bundles and combinations of goods and services that we can create in our economy? What combination of house, houses and cars and clothes and vacations and medical care are we going to create out of our limited resources? The second question is, how will it be produced? That is, how will we combine labor and capital and raw materials to create the goods and services that satisfy our needs and wants? And the third question is, who is going to get it? That is, how will these goods and services be divided among all of the people in the economy, each of whom wants more? What will we produce? How will it be produced? And who will get it? These are the questions that economics asks. Economics also asks more specific questions about each of these general categories, such as, what would happen if we imposed a minimum wage law on the labor market? Would it create unemployment? Would it increase the wealth of workers? What would be the consequence? We're asking a question here, and that's the beginning of science. What would happen if consumer income increases? Would it lead to more spending? 
or more saving, or something else. Ask the question, and the next thing you know, you'll find yourself at the second step of the scientific method. That is, you'll be building a model. What is an economic model? What is a scientific model? A model really is nothing more than a map. Think for a moment about the way a map works. You begin with a question. How do I get from the theater district to the Metropolitan Museum if I'm in New York City? Well, that answer is going to depend on the method of transportation that you choose. If you want to know how I would find the best walking route, that is, which streets should I take and can I cut through Central Park, you're going to want to use this map. It's a street map of New York City that has the parks and restaurants and theaters and museums right here in different colors. On the other hand, if you're planning to take the subway from the theater district and find out how close you can get to the Metropolitan Museum, you'll want to use this inset map, which instead of the streets, focuses on the subway routes, each of them being color-coded. The map that you want to choose depends on the question that you originally ask. If you're going to be riding the subway and your question is, which subway should I take, you don't need a map that has a lot of streets on it. You want all that detail cut away so that you can clearly see the subway routes. On the other hand, if you're going to be above ground walking on the streets, you don't care what's underneath you. The subway routes are irrelevant and would only add clutter to this picture. So a good map is one that includes enough information to help you answer your question without irrelevant information that would only distract you and clutter the picture. The same is true with a model. If we want to ask ourselves, what is, the relation, what is it that determines the amount of money that households spend on consumer goods and services each year? What determines consumer spending? And when does it rise? And when does it fall? We're going to want to build a relationship between consumer spending and other variables that influence it. We're going to be looking for those variables that probably have the most direct impact on the consumer's choice to spend or save money, and to ignore the rest. So as we're building this model, we're going to want to include things like consumer income, taxes, the stock market, and other factors that influence how much money people choose to spend. We can probably ignore other things that bear less on the consumer spending decision such as the gender of the children or the color of the breadwinner's hair. I mean, these are real facts from the real world, but they probably aren't very important in determining how much money people spend. Margaret Mead once said that a model that is completely realistic is no more useful than a map with a scale of one to one. That is, the only reason the map helps you is that it's simple enough and simplified enough to help you see the big picture and the details that are necessary in helping you guide your way through the city. On a typical map, you won't see trees and dogs and cars because they're not necessary. And by eliminating them and showing you the grid of the streets, you are helped in navigating your way around New York. So we build a model. And perhaps that model is uh, a story whereby people make spending decisions based on their income, their taxes, and their age. People who are younger tend to spend more, then save more in their middle years, and spend it in retirement. And we build a relationship among these variables, and that becomes our model of how consumers make their spending decisions. Now, once we've got a model, the relationships that we imagine hold among the variables allow us to derive certain hypotheses. Hypotheses are predictions about the way the world works. One hypothesis might be that an increase in consumer income leads to an increase in consumer spending. Now, that hypothesis is something we can test. We can go out and get data from the real world and compare the relationship between observed consumer income changes and changes in consumer spending. And if our data matches the predictions of our model, then we believe that we've explained something about the real world. We believe that since our story matches the facts, we've come to understand more thoroughly the way the world works. This is the scientific method. Ask a question, isolate the variables that are related and important, and build a model, and then come up with some predictions or hypotheses that you can test against the data in the real world. And when that happens, you're doing science. Now, one of the things that helps you be a careful and disciplined scientist is looking at these changes in a careful way that is trying to isolate the variables from one another and looking at the effect of one variable while holding the other variables constant. For instance, we want to know 
what happens to consumer spending when consumer income changes. And we're trying to predict a relationship between income and consumption that will explain something about the way the world works. Well, if we want to do that, we need to hold constant the other factors that influence consumer spending decisions. So if we hold taxes constant, my pink bar here over the T means that I'm holding taxes constant. And we look at consumers of a particular age so that we hold age and demographic factors constant. Then what's the relationship between income and consumer spending? And perhaps we predict in our model that if you increase income and hold everything else constant, consumer spending will also increase. This assumption that we're holding everything else constant has a name. That assumption is called ceteris paribus. And the question that we ask is, what will happen to consumer spending if we increase consumer income ceteris paribus? That is, holding constant all of the other variables that also influence consumption decisions. So, whenever you hear me use the term ceteris paribus, what I'm doing is I'm isolating a variable. I'm saying, what will happen to consumption when income increases? Let's focus on income and hold everything else constant. That's what ceteris paribus means. So, you're training now to be an economist. You're training to use the scientific method in order to answer questions about the way the world works. So, what are you going to do with this training once you've sharpened these skills? Well, you can find economists in all walks of life. Economists show up in business, they show up in government, and they show up in academics. In business, economists make forecasts about what's going to happen to interest rates and consumer spending and housing starts. They look at the big picture and help to advise the people who are making decisions in corporations about when to launch a new product and when to expand their operations and into which countries. In government, you find economists doing research, collecting data, figuring out uh, how to uh, finance the government debt, when to impose new taxes, and looking at broadly at what's happening in the economy to consumer spending, business spending, and imports and exports. And finally, in academics, not only do you find people who are teaching your economics classes, you also find high caliber researchers who hold academic positions in research universities. They are supported to do research and answer questions like what will happen when a minimum wage is imposed, or what's the relationship between income and consumption, or what's the effect of tariffs and quotas on the flow of international trade. Economists show up in business, government, and academics. And as you train to be an economist, you'll find that you can use these tools even if your title is an economist, because these logical, scientific ways of thinking pay off in all kinds of lines of business. There's one more thing to say about economics as a study, and that is that we want to make a careful distinction between positive economics on one hand and normative economics on the other. Positive economics is economics as a predictive, descriptive social science. Positive economics seeks to answer the question, how does the world work? What is going on? Whenever we do positive economics, we're making observations. We're asking questions like, what will happen when a minimum wage law is imposed on the labor market? Will we see unemployment? Will we see an increase in wealth? Positive economics answers the question, what will happen in the bread market if we impose a tax on the sales of bread? Positive economics answers questions about the way the world works, what is, predictions, and descriptions. On the other hand, normative economics is about making judgments or evaluations. Normative economics answers the question, how should the world work? What is a good outcome? Normative economics answers the question, should we have a minimum wage law at all? Or is there a better way to provide for low-income workers, perhaps an earned income tax credit or some other policy? Normative economics is about norms, and norms are standards of judgment. What is good, what is better, and what is bad? Whenever we're doing normative economics, we're seeking to come up with the best policy for a particular situation. Should the government pay off the national debt? Should we have a tax on gasoline or cigarettes? Normative economics answers the question, what is good? 
Now, of course, if you're going to want to make judgments about uh, the way the world should work, you probably better have a pretty good understanding about the way the world actually does work. That is, if you want to build a garden that you think is beautiful, you need to know a lot about the way plants grow and which ones respond to sunlight and which ones respond to fertilizer. You need to understand the structure of the economy before you start saying what it is that the government ought to do or what it is that corporations should be allowed or prohibited from doing. To make judgments, you should have an understanding of the structure of the relationships in the economy. So positive economics and normative economics are very closely related. So if you want to be an economist, you'll be using the scientific method to describe and make predictions and eventually make recommendations about what kind of policies help lead to good outcomes. Economists use graphs to represent a lot of their analysis. So we'll take a while here to review how graphs work and see how we'll be applying them throughout the lessons. You're familiar with graphs like pie charts, which show you how one uh, sum can be divided up into its parts. You're also familiar with bar charts that show you how a uh, sum changes over time or can be divided up also into its parts. In economics, we're going to use uh, graphs in two-dimensional space. And these graphs usually represent relationships between two variables, or in some cases, relationships among three variables. What we'll do in this lesson is uh, show you how those graphs work and prepare you for tools that we'll be using in other lessons. Let's start by having a look at the two-dimensional graph space. We have a vertical axis along which we measure the quantity of one variable, and a horizontal axis along which we measure the quantity of another variable. And usually, these two variables are related in some way that the economist finds interesting. Let's look at an example of information that we represent in this two-dimensional space. Suppose we want to graph the relationship between two variables, consumption and household income. Consumption is the amount of money that a household spends on goods and services, and income is their income, the money that they take in from work and other sources. Now, how are we going to represent the relationship between consumption and income? Let's start by graphing income on the horizontal axis, and I will use this abbreviation, INC, to stand for the household's income, and we'll measure this income in dollars. So I'll put a dollar sign here to remind me that everything that's measured on this axis is measured in dollars. Now I can calibrate the axis by marking off these tick marks and putting numbers along them so that I have a scale along which to represent my information. Let me let each of these tick marks represent $10,000 worth of annual income. So the first tick mark here I could label 10 for $10,000. The second tick mark I could label 20. The third I could label 30. And I might want to be careful here not to put too many numbers close together or the graph could start to get crowded and unwieldy. So what I'll do is I'll skip every other 10,000 and represent 10, 30, 50, 70,000. Here's 80. I'll skip it. 90, 100,000, 110, and 130. And the numbers, of course, continue as you go out. The numbers increase, representing larger annual incomes as you move to the right. On the vertical axis now, I'll represent the other variable. And this is going to be consumption spending, which I'll represent with the letter C. So as I increase my vertical altitude here, I'm increasing the consumption spending of this household. I'll put a dollar sign here to remind me that consumption is measured in dollars. And I'll do the same thing that I did on the horizontal axis. I'll calibrate using tens. And I'll skip every other one so that I don't get too crowded. Here's $50,000 in annual consumption spending. Here's 70. Here's 90. Here's 110. And just let the numbers go on up. 
Now, what I do in this space, now that I've created it, is I can represent information about consumption spending. Suppose I have a table of numbers, and one of the numbers that I have, suppose I have a table of numbers, and each one of these numbers represents the income spending information for a particular household. Each household, each data point that I have, represents the behavior of a household. So I'm going to put data points in this graph, and each point will represent the behavior of one particular household. So suppose I have a household, and I know that their annual income is $30,000, and their annual consumer spending is $40,000. Now, you might ask, how, how can that happen? If their income is only 30000 how could they spend 40000 Well, perhaps they have other sources from which to get money. Perhaps they have uh, savings that they can draw on, or perhaps they receive payments from the government or other sources of income. So if I know that a household that has a $30,000 annual income is spending $40,000, a year on consumption spending, I will go up to this point and put a dot where those two numbers come together. Now notice, the horizontal coordinates of this point represent the income of the household, that is $30,000. The vertical co coordinates represent the consumption spending. So see, each point in this space represents a combination of two pieces of information about a single household, their annual income, and their consumption spending for that year. I can label this point with a pair of numbers that represent its coordinates. I'll write first the horizontal coordinates, that is 30, to represent their income, or 30,000. And second, I'll write the vertical coordinates of 40, to represent the spending data. Now, sometimes you'll hear the information represented here called the X variable, or this number called the X axis. The horizontal axis is sometimes referred to as X, and the first number here represents the X coordinate. Sometimes this axis is called the Y axis, and the number that's represented here is the Y coordinate. So the numbers in parentheses are the X and the Y, the horizontal and the vertical numbers here, written side by side. And each point in this space will have two numbers, two coordinates associated with it. Now let's suppose that I have data on a lot of households, and I know the income and the spending for several households. I can represent the points in this space and form what we call a scatter diagram. The scatter diagram just tosses the points out in this space and looks at them. So why don't we do that? If I have information, say, that a house that has a, uh, an income of $10,000 was spending $30,000 that year, I can put a point here with a horizontal coordinate of 10 and a vertical coordinate of 30. Suppose I know that a household that had $90,000 annual income was spending 70. So let's put a point up here with a horizontal coordinate of 90 and a vertical coordinate of 70. By the way, what was that household doing? If they were spending less than their income, then they were saving the difference. And then, suppose I have a lot of other points. I'll just graph some samples here. Suppose I had a point like this one, and 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 so forth. Each point represents a combination of income and spending for one particular household. And as I fill in the information that I have, in each case I'm representing the household's income by the horizontal and the household's consumption by the vertical. This is a scatter plot. It's information arrayed in a two-dimensional space to represent two variables for each data point, that is, the income and the associated consumption spending for one particular household. Now, once you've got a scatter plot like this, the next thing that you're tempted to do is to fit a line to that information to notice the general relationship between the two variables. Notice, as we look at this information, in general, as income increases, consumption spending increases for these data points. We say that there is a direct relationship between income and consumption. 
a direct relationship or a positive relationship between these points. If I wanted to notice the general relationship, I could fit a line to these points that would look something like this. And this line represents the general relationship between consumption and income. That is, in general, for the points in this data set, as income increases, consumption spending increases. The thing that's important to notice here is because of the direct relationship, the line that passes through these points has a positive slope. Now, what does that mean, a positive slope? I'll get to that in just a moment. But I want to stop here and make the point that in economics, one of the first things that we do is we notice general relationships between data points. We notice, for example, that when income increases, consumption increases, we observe a positive or a direct relationship among the points. We've been looking at linear relationships between variables and how economists think about these. So far, everything that we've looked at has had a constant slope. That is, we've been analyzing straight line relationships, such as the relationship between price and quantity in Bob's demand for hamburgers. Now we're going to look at a relationship that is not linear. In fact, it's what we call curvilinear. It is a line that's not straight. We're going to see how we draw a relationship like that and how we calculate the slope of a relationship where the slope is not constant. In order to do that, let's look at the relationship between labor and output for a firm that makes television sets. And I've uh, made up these numbers so that I can fit a curvilinear line to them. Here is my relationship. If you have one worker working by himself, he can make a single television in a day. If you have two workers cooperating, they can make four televisions in a day. If you have three workers, nine, four workers, 16, five workers can make 25 televisions, and so forth. Now, notice this relationship is one of exponential increase. That is, the number of TVs are increasing much faster than the number of workers. So in this case, our slope will not be constant. Let's represent this relationship now in a picture. I'm going to take my axes here and use the axes to represent the amount of labor that the firm uses. So we're going to measure labor on the horizontal axis. And on the vertical axis, we're going to measure output. And in this case, it's going to be output of television sets. So each point in this space will represent a combination of labor and output. This is a production relationship. So, for example, one worker is able to produce a single television if he's working by himself. So, since I've calibrated these axes where each of my lines represents two TVs, my first dot will be halfway up towards this point at one worker and one television set. So, here's my first point on my product curve. The second point on my product curve will be two workers and four television sets. So that's going to be, at this point right here, three workers are able to produce nine television sets. So that gives me a point like this. Four workers are able to produce 16 television sets. So follow this line up here to 16. And five workers can produce 25 television sets. So follow this line all the way up to 25, which will be right here. Now, connecting these dots is going to be a little bit more complicated than connecting the dots in our earlier story. In the earlier story, all we had to do was pick any two points, draw a straight line between them, and we had a demand curve. But the production curve is not linear. That is, the slope is not constant, so I have to draw a curve that connects these points together. That curve is going to look something like this. Let me take a curve here and figure out how to make it fit. I want it to go through this point, and this point, and this point, and this point, and this point. And so my curve is going to look something like this. It's going to be an exponential relationship. So if I want to connect my dots, 
I'm going to have them lying along the blue line that looks like this. Let me go ahead and draw that blue line in. I could have kept that curve there and just drawn along it, but I'm going to try, and it takes practice to do this well, to connect my blue dots along a single curved line. It's like this. Well, that's not bad. So I'll go ahead and make this line a little bit darker. And there's my production function for a firm that hires workers to produce television sets. And we might call this curve the total product curve. We'll be studying this later in the, in the lectures. So I'll go ahead and label this TP, total product. And this total product curve depends on lots of things, like the technology of the firm and the size of their factory and other things. What I'm mainly interested in at this point, though, is figuring out what the slope of this curve is at a particular point. Say, for instance, we are looking at this point right here, the point where we're hiring two workers and making four television sets in a day. And I'd like to know what is the slope of the curve at this point when I'm hiring two workers and making four television sets a day. What's the slope of the curve? That is, what's the rise over the run? How many extra television sets will I be able to produce if I hire an extra worker? Well, to calculate the slope of a straight line, it's not quite as simple as looking at two points on the curve. Because as you move from one point to another, what's happening is that the line itself is changing its slope. Down here, our blue curve is relatively flat. That is, if we look at a point down here, we get a relatively flat line. But as we move up the curve, notice the line is getting steeper and steeper and steeper. The slope is changing all along this blue curve. So if we want to calculate the slope at a particular point, we can't just look at the slope between two points on the curve, because as you move from here to here, even that small movement represents a change in the slope or, or causes a change in the slope of my total product curve. The blue curve slope is changing. Well, here's how we do this. We calculate the slope of a single point on this curve. We calculate the slope at a single point by taking the limit of slopes of lines that connect two points on the curve. So for instance, suppose we look at what happens as we move from two workers to four workers. As we move from two workers to four workers, what happens is this. We're moving along a line that connects those two points. And the line that connects those two points is this line right here. This red line connects those two points. Now, what's the slope of that red line that connects this dot with this dot? What's the slope of that line? Well, let's calculate it. The slope of my red line here is equal to the rise over the run, or the change in the vertical axis variable, that is, a change in the number of television sets, divided by the change in the number of workers. Well, the change in the number of television sets is going to be 16 minus 4, which is going to be equal to 12. And divide that by the change in the number of workers, which is going to be 4 minus 2. And that's going to give me a slope of 12 over 2 equals 6. The slope of this red line right here, that is, its rise over its run is going to be 6. The slope of that line is 6. However, if I took a different red line, say the red line that connects this dot to this one, its, its nearest neighbor, we're going to get a different slope. Let me go ahead and draw that. If I connect this dot with the nearest neighbor, my red line is going to be a bit flatter. Now, it's a little harder to see that line because it's almost right on top of the blue line. But what we've got here is a line that connects this dot with its nearest neighbor. I'd like to know what's its slope, what's the rise over the run as I move from this point to the next. 
So let's look then at the slope as we move from two workers to three workers. In that case, the slope once again is rise over the run, but the slope along this point is going to be a little bit different. And the slope in that case is going to be equal to the output has changed from 9 or to 9 from 4 divided by a change in workers from 2 to 3 gives us a slope of four, 9 minus 4 is 5 over 1, which is going to be equal to 5. So the slope at this point is 5. Notice what's happening. As we move from this original red line that connected these two points to the red line that connects two closer points, the slope is getting flatter. It's gone from rise over run of 6 to rise over run of 5. Eventually what happens is if we let the point that we're looking at get closer and closer to our original point, if we let the point that we're looking at get closer and closer to our original point, we're eventually going to come up with a line that has a slope that is equal to the slope of the blue curve itself. Eventually what we get is what we call a tangent line. The tangent line is the line that just touches the blue curve. If you had something straight like this ruler and you wanted to lay it against the blue curve, Laying the ruler against the blue curve would give you the tangent line. Laying something straight against a curved line at a particular point gives you the tangent. Tangent means touching. If you wanted to take the blue curve like before and lay it against the blue curve and have this blue curve be a straight line, the slope of this blue curve now is the slope of the tangent line, the line that just touches. So to calculate the slope of a curve at a particular point, you take the limit of the slope of the lines that connect that point to other points, and that limit is going to be the tangent line, the slope that's tangent. So when we're looking for the slope of a curved line, we take the slopes of lines that connect points on the curve, let those slopes change as the point gets closer and closer to the point we're interested in, and finally we come up with a line that's tangent to the curve at the point we care about. In this particular case, from calculus, I know that the tangent line that I've drawn here with a dash has a slope of 4. I'm not going to do the calculus right now, but what I'm interested in your understanding is that when you have a curved line, the slope of that line changes as you move along it. And the important thing for you to know that the slope of that curve at a particular point is the slope of a straight line that touches the curve at that point. We've seen how economists use graphs to represent relationships between two variables. Now we'll see how an economist can represent a relationship among three variables in a two-dimensional graph. The trick is you only change two variables at a time. Suppose we're interested in a relationship among three variables, and a good example would be making a map of a terrain. In this case, you've got three variables that change as you move across a terrain. One is your east-west coordinate, called your longitude. The other is your north-south coordinate, called your latitude. And finally, there is the distance that the terrain lies above sea level or below sea level, the altitude or the height of the point. As you move through a terrain, all three variables are changing, east-west, north-south, and height above sea level. So when we draw a map, how do we represent these three variables? Let's look at a set of data points, and then we'll show how we represent them in a graph. Suppose we have a set of combinations of latitude and longitude for which the altitude remains constant. That is, let's look at points that have a constant altitude of 1,000 feet above sea level. And if we identify a set of these points, we'll find that the latitude and longitudes that give us an altitude of 1,000 can be written down in a table. Suppose that at a latitude of 200 feet north and 600 feet east, we have an altitude of 1,000 feet. 
Suppose at another point, a latitude of 100 feet north and 100 feet east, we have an altitude also of 1,000. And finally, a third combination. Notice the trick here is I'm holding my altitude constant as I change latitude and longitude. All of these combinations of latitude and longitude have a constant altitude of 1,000. So let's move these numbers over to the box at the side and then show how to represent them in a graph. On the vertical axis, we will measure the distance north or south, or the latitude. On the horizontal axis, we'll measure the distance east and west, or the longitude. And altitude will represent in a special way in the graph, and I'll show you in just a moment. So let's look again at those points that we started with. Suppose that we are considering the point 60 east and west, 200 north and south, and an altitude of 1,000 that will lie in this picture in this way. First, put the longitude on the horizontal axis. The longitude of 60 means that we are at a point like this one. The latitude of 200 means that we are up here at 200. So I'll put a dot here to represent that combination of latitude and longitude. With 100 and 100, we also get the same altitude. And finally, with 280, we get the same altitude. Each of these three dots represents a latitude and a longitude combination with a constant altitude of 1,000. So what I can do to make it easier is I can connect all the points that have an altitude of 1,000 and label this curve 1,000. This collection of points is sometimes called an isoquant from the word that means same quantities. That is, each of the points on this curve represents a combination of latitude and longitude with a constant altitude of 1,000. Now, this is not the only isoquant that we can draw. We can now change the altitude and find another set of combinations of latitude and longitude that have a different constant altitude. Let's consider another set of information here. Suppose we look at this table of numbers. Here are combinations of latitude and longitude that have a constant altitude of 2,000. 200 north and 200 east gives us an altitude of 2,000. Same with 140 and 300 and so forth. Each set of combinations here of latitude and longitude gives us a constant altitude of 2,000. So now let's represent this set of points with a different isoquant in the same graph. Let's start with a combination of 200, 200, with a longitude of 200 and a latitude of 200. We're going to get this point right here, and that has an altitude of 2,000. We also get an altitude of 2,000 with a longitude of 140 and a latitude of 300. That would be this point right here. 300 and 100 gives us another combination with an altitude of 2,000. And finally, one last point. Here, at a latitude of 300 and a longitude of 380, we also have an altitude of 2,000. Now, we can connect all of these dots to get another isoquant, that is, another collection of points where the altitude is constant, this time at an altitude of 2,000. However, notice this dot lies way up here. It doesn't appear to be on the same curve as these three dots. In fact, if I had more points, what I would see is that this isoquant is actually an oval shape that comes around and connects to itself. Unlike this isoquant, which doesn't appear to bend back on itself, here's a complete set of points where all of these dots form a closed oval with an altitude of 2,000. If I had other altitudes, I could form other isoquants, that is, other points with constant altitude. For example, this oval might represent a set of points that have an altitude of 3,000. 
And finally, here in the middle, there might be a point at the top of our hill that has an altitude of 3,500. Here, then, is our isoquant map. What I've done is I've collected points together that have constant altitude. You can imagine here a topographical map where the altitude is rising as we move up to the northeast, and then after you go over the top of the hill, you begin to lose altitude. In fact, what you're seeing here are cross sections of a hillside. Imagine a plane coming through and lopping off a hillside at a certain altitude. Here's what it would look like if it were lopped off at 1,000. Here's what it would look like if it were lopped off at 2,000. Here's the shape of all of those points with an altitude of 3,000, and so forth. This is the way an economist represents three dimensions in a two-dimensional graph. We use the two axes to represent two of our dimensions, in this case, east and west and north and south. And we use the third dimension in the graph, and we represent the third dimension in the graph as the numbers on the isoquant lines. Later, we'll be using this tool to represent consumer preferences, as well as the trade-off between factors of production in the making of goods and services. I know what you're thinking. You're wondering what the difference is between micro and macro, and you want to know which one's easier. Well, let's start with this explanation. Microeconomics is about the decision-making process of individuals, households deciding whether they're going to buy apples or oranges, a firm deciding whether it's going to install a computer or hire another worker. Macroeconomics is about the aggregate. Whenever you lump together all of these households and business and the government and foreign trade, what kind of organism do you get? In fact, that's a good way of thinking about it. Let's use a biological metaphor. Microeconomics is like the study of a cell, the mitochondria and the nucleus and the way energy is created and the way the cell works. And we put the microscope in on this particular cell and we look at its chemical processes. Macroeconomics is stepping back and letting these cells merge until they become a body, something that doesn't look like a cell at all, but in fact has arms and legs and does different things. Cells metabolize energy. Bodies reach over and pick up an apple and eat it. Macroeconomics is about the study of the economy as an organism. It's an organism that has its own vital signs, like inflation and unemployment and the interest rate and the money supply. Macroeconomics is a look at the overall economy as an organism. Microeconomics is looking at how the cell works. So, apart from this metaphor, how does this work in economics? Well, in microeconomics, we're going to be answering questions about the way individuals respond to changes in relative prices. For instance, in microeconomics, we ask the question, if the wage rate goes up, will a household supply more labor or less? You can argue it either way, right? A higher wage causes you to substitute your energy away from leisure towards labor so that you can afford to buy more toys. On the other hand, the higher wage increases your wealth, which inclines you then to want to take more vacations and to work less. Microeconomics is a study about the way a particular household would respond to a change in its incentives created by a movement in the wage. Macroeconomics, on the other hand, steps back and looks at all of these households together and asks a question like, what happens when productivity increases in our economy? Will the overall employment rate, that is the percentage of people who are actually able to work working in jobs, will that increase or decrease? Do computers increase employment in the economy or do they reduce it? Macroeconomics asks questions about the money supply. 
Now, I know I told you before, probably, that economics isn't about money. Well, that's only partly true, because once you're talking about economics as the study of the economy as an organism, money is the lifeblood of that organism. And whenever the Federal Reserve creates and prints and puts into circulation more money, well, people have more in their bank accounts and they can compete more aggressively for goods and services in the market. And that will probably, in fact, most definitely have an influence on the price level, as well as the ease of getting credit and a loan if you are a business that wants to expand. Macroeconomics does study money. And it looks at how the Federal Reserve's activity in the economy, the creation and circulation of money, influences the price level, which in turn may influence businesses' investment decisions and household purchases. Microeconomics, on the other hand, pretty much ignores money. We treat the world as if it's one big barter system where you trade apples for cups of coffee without having to use bills or change. In microeconomics, we look at relative prices. Everything is expressed as maybe two apples equals a cup of coffee without thinking about how things are paid for. Whenever relative prices change, people change their purchasing decisions. They change their spending patterns. But in macroeconomics, money is studied much the way that blood is studied in biology. It carries things through the system. It carries nutrition. When the blood supply increases, that changes the health of the organism. Too much or too little blood within a body can create problems. The same thing is true with money and the economy. So one important difference between macro and microeconomics is that micro is the study of individual decision making. Macroeconomics is the study of the economy as an organism. Another important distinction is that while microeconomics doesn't really pay much attention to money as a phenomenon, macroeconomics takes money very seriously, and the money supply is an important determinant of the health of the economy. Now, in micro and macroeconomics both, there are actors, that is, people who are making decisions. Let's look at who we're going to be studying in macroeconomics and talk about how our perspective on them differs from the way we thought about them in microeconomics. The important players in the macroeconomy are households, businesses, the government, and the rest of the world, which is linked to a particular economy by foreign trade. In macroeconomics, the spending of households is called consumption. Whenever households spend money, they are said to engage in consumption. The alternative to consumption is savings. And another thing a household can do is it can use its income to pay taxes. Now, in microeconomics, we answered questions like, what happens when this household goes to the grocery store? Do they buy apples or do they buy oranges? In macroeconomics, on the other hand, we're going to ask about what determines the amount of consumption spending overall that this household will do in a year. And we'll look at variables like income, taxes, and age as influential on the consumption decisions of this household. What about businesses? In microeconomics, we answered questions like, will this business choose to um, hire an extra worker or an extra machine at this point? That is, in what ratio will this business employ capital and labor? And if the wage rate increases, we found that businesses were inclined to hire less labor because it was more expensive and substitute and hire more capital instead. That's a microeconomic analysis. On the macro side, what we do is we look at the big picture. When interest rates go up or interest rates go down, are businesses inclined to do more investment spending or less? That is, what influences the overall amount of spending that businesses are inclined to do? Rather than looking at individual decisions within the firm, we consider businesses as part of this overall organism, and we ask what determines the amount of spending that they plan to do. Next, we look at the government. From the point of view of microeconomics, we didn't talk that much about the government because the government seems to mainly be a policy player. In microeconomics, the government set the tax rates, which influenced people's purchasing decisions. In macroeconomics, on the other hand, we usually think about government spending as a stimulus to the economy or government debt as creating bonds, which create a financial market, which has other benefits for the economy. Government plays a big role in macroeconomics as a policy player, not in the sense of influencing individual decisions, as they did by setting tax rates in micro, but because the government can choose to pump up the economy by spending more money or to slow it down by spending less. 
Also, the Federal Reserve, although not, not technically part of the federal government, really seems like a government entity. That is, the central bank is kind of part of the government, and it's the central bank that determines the amount of money that's in circulation, which influences the price level and other factors, uh, variables in the economy. Finally, we have foreigners, and we didn't talk about foreigners in microeconomics at all, but now the foreign sector becomes very important because the demand for our goods overseas determines the amount that we can export, and that's going to determine how much factories are going to be inclined to produce. Factories tend not to produce goods they can't sell, and foreign demand becomes an important component in the macro economy. So, these are the players in the macro economy. These are the players, and the way that we think about them in macroeconomics is broadly. Consumers spend money, pay taxes, and save. Businesses spend on investment goods. The government increases spending, maybe runs a deficit, maybe pays off its debt. And foreigners, depending on the exchange rate, may buy more of our goods or less. Now, there's one more thing that we're going to want to consider whenever we think about macroeconomics. I've already mentioned the importance of money in macroeconomics, and that raises the question of being careful whenever we're discussing uh, a particular economic um, story, of being clear about whether we're talking about a real variable or a nominal variable. Anything measured in terms of money is considered nominal. So, for instance, if I hold up this cup of coffee and you can see the price tag on it, if I want to talk in real terms, it's one cup of coffee. When we talk about real goods and services, we're talking about physical, tangible, actual goods and services that people enjoy. Cups of coffee, apples, haircuts, vacations, medical care. However, this is also a dollar twenty-five worth of coffee. That is, I can represent this coffee in nominal terms by talking about how much money I would have to pay to get it in the market. Things measured in terms of money are called nominal variables. So here is one dollar, a nominal measure. And here is one dollar and twenty-five cents worth of coffee, another nominal measure. The neat thing about nominal measures is they're very easy to add up. If an apple is 50 cents and a cup of coffee is $1.25, 50 cents and $1.25 is $1.75, that's nominal spending. That's how much money I paid out today to get the things I enjoyed for breakfast. However, real goods and services are actual things that are harder to add up because they're in some respects non-conformable. I mean, how do you add apples and oranges and coffee and medical care? What we tend to do in economics is we add up the dollar amounts that are paid for these goods and services, and we divide by something that reduces them to a common denominator. I'm going to be discussing that later, but right now I want you to be clear on the distinction between real and nominal variables. Things that are measured in terms of money are nominal. Things that are discussed measured in terms of physical goods and services are real. Let's look at what happens to the relationship between price and quantity when we change Bob's income. We've seen already that Bob has a relationship between the price of hamburgers and the quantity that he consumes per week. We looked at these tables last time, and we imagined, although I didn't say so, that Bob's income was $500 per week. Now, if Bob gets a bigger income, he's going to change his behavior. Let's suppose that Bob's income goes up to $600 a week. If it does, we might expect that Bob would spend more money on hamburgers than before. Let me replace the old set of numbers with the new set. This is Bob's behavior when the income that he earns goes up to $600 per week. In this case, we see that although he still buys no hamburgers at a price of $5 a piece, he'll now buy one when the price drops to $4.50. And then, each time the price drops by 50 cents, he'll add one more hamburger to his weekly consumption, so that by the time we get down to a dollar per hamburger, Bob's buying eight hamburgers a week. That is, some days he's eating more than one. Let's now represent this new set of data in the graph that we originally drew. I'll go now back to my two-dimensional diagram with the quantity of hamburgers on the horizontal axis, 
and the price at which hamburgers are selling on the vertical axis. Let's look at this new relationship between price and quantity, the numbers that are now in the table beside me. Let me take my pen and chart these numbers. We can see that now at a price of $5, Bob buys no hamburgers. So the intercept of our term, that is the lowest price at which Bob buys zero hamburgers, has moved up, the intercept has moved up to $5. At a price of $4.50, Bob now actually buys a hamburger. So we have a point like this, $4.50 and one hamburger. At a price of $4, Bob is now buying two hamburgers, so we have a point like this, a combination of the price of $400 and the quantity of two. At a price of $3.50, Bob is now buying three hamburgers, so I have the price $3.50, $3, the price of $3.50 and the quantity of three, represented by this point, and so forth. Every time the price drops by $0.50, cents, Bob buys one more hamburger than he bought before. As we keep moving down to lower prices, we get larger quantities. We still have the same negative relationship between price and quantity. That is, we have the negative slope, the same negative relationship, but the numbers are now different. Here, down at a price of a dollar, Bob is buying eight hamburgers per week. I can connect the dots now and form Bob's new demand curve. And let me do that with this new information. I'm going to use my straight edge here to try to draw things carefully. There's no point in being precise, being imprecise, if I have all the information that I need to be precise. And here's Bob's new demand curve. The new demand curve, which I might label D prime, and the prime, or the apostrophe, just means a new relationship to compare to the old relationship. The new relationship between price and quantity has the same slope as the old curve. That is, notice the curves are parallel. For every 50 cent increase in the price, Bob still reduces the quantity of hamburgers that he buys by one. So the rise over the run is still negative 50 cents. We've got the same slope. And sometimes we'll represent that by putting two marks on these curves. And the two marks mean that they have the same slope. They are parallel. The formula for this new curve is going to be given as follows. The price on the new curve is equal to the intercept, which is $5, minus the slope of $0.50 cents times the quantity of hamburgers, <clears throat> times the quantity of hamburgers that's consumed. The formula for the new line is going to be price is equal to $5, that's our intercept, minus 50 cents, the slope, times the quantity of hamburgers consumed. This is the relationship if Bob's income increases to $600. We might think of this as the curve shifting outwards. If we wanted to represent our original demand curve like this, then with the increase in income, we get a new set of points that moves the demand curve outwards. You can think of this as a shift in the curve. Let's look at another set of numbers. Now suppose that Bob's income drops from $600 a week back to a lower income of $400 a week. In that case, what's going to happen to Bob's consumption? Well, here's a table of numbers that represents the number of burgers that Bob consumes if his income is $400. And let's look at these numbers together. What we see is that at an income of $400, Bob is not going to buy a hamburger until the price drops to $350. That's the uh, price at which he is first willing to purchase burgers. Then, as the price falls by $0.50, cents, he'll buy another one, and so forth and so forth. And when the price gets down to $1 a week, and when the price gets down to $1 per hamburger, Bob will buy six hamburgers per week. So in this case, we can see that at a lower income, Bob will buy fewer hamburgers at every price. Let's represent this set of numbers, which I'll move over to the box, on the graph. Going back to our diagram with the price on the vertical axis and the quantity on the horizontal, if the number of burgers that Bob buys a week falls because of the decline in his income, we get a new set of points. Notice now that Bob will not buy any hamburgers when the price is $4 a week. So we can put a dot here at $4 and zero to represent Bob's behavior with the lower income. This is going to be the new intercept, the lowest price at which Bob buys no hamburgers. 
If the price drops down to 350, Bob will buy his first hamburger. So we get a dot like this. If the price drops down to $3 a hamburger, Bob will buy two hamburgers. We get a dot like this. And so forth. Just go through and fill on the numbers from the chart. 250 gets us three hamburgers. A price of $2 gets us four hamburgers. A price of $150 gets us five hamburgers. A price of a dollar gets us six hamburgers per week. And so forth. Now, if I want to connect these numbers, I can form the new demand curve for Bob at the lower income. So let me connect these dots. And when I do, I get a new demand curve. And this one we could represent by D double prime. Again, the primes just remind us we have a new relationship or a new set of points. And again, it's going to have the same slope. All three of these lines are parallel. One of them represents Bob's behavior when income is high. One represents Bob's behavior when income is in the middle, $500. And finally, the third represents Bob's behavior when income is low. The slope in all three cases, that is the rise over the run, is going to be the same. But the intercept is different. And that's what gives us these parallel shifts. This third relationship can be summarized by the equation, the price is equal to $4, that is the vertical intercept, minus the slope of 50 cents, times the quantity of hamburgers that Bob consumes each week. In this case, we have a lower intercept. The curve is closer to the origin, but it has the same slope as before. So notice the difference between the three curves is their intercepts. The first curve is the one that's in the middle with an intercept of 450. The second curve is this one right here with a higher intercept. And the third curve is the one with the lower intercept. Each of these three is a relationship between price and quantity for Bob. The difference is in the income. And when the income changes, we get a whole new relationship between price and quantity.